Hey, what's up you guys? It's Dorothy and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 19 of How to Disappear by Sharon Huss Wrote. I hope that you guys are ready for this video and are enjoying these videos for this book as much as I am. So let's get right into this video. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, please click off of the video now. You have been warned. There we go. I float through the rest of the morning on, the mo on that moment with Lipton and the hope of his forgiveness it's almost like crowd surfing at the Foo Fighters concert being lifted up that way or saved at least from falling flat on my face I know I don't deserve it in the yearbook office at lunch the brainstorming on how to make the yearbook but not suck continues Marissa wants something groundbreaking she wants to write about it in her college applications she wants to win awards could we not have eight pages of football says Marvel flipping through last year's yearbook and why do the cheerleaders get two pages and the when the LGB TQ club only gets one lousy photo. I guarantee there are more LGBTQ kids at this school than their cheerleaders. Yeah, but they don't build pyramids wearing mini skirts, Beth Ann says with a fake smile. Marvo shakes his head. Some kids aren't in here at all. I was in five photos last year. How many were you in? Beth Ann says three. Marissa cringes 16. They all turn to me. I shrug as if I don't remember if I, if that Remember that I was in zero yearbook pictures. I purposely hid in the bathroom when they took the freshman class photo. Marvel turns the index in the back of the yearbook where every student is listed alphabetically, along with pages of which they are pictured. My name is there, but no page numbers. He looks up. You weren't in the yearbook at all? I shake my head. That's just wrong. It's okay, I say quietly. No, it's not. He flips through the book and stops at two-page collage of the most popular kids with their friends, hugging, smiling, laughing. Marissa is in at least three of the pictures. The spread is titled Friends, but this is obviously subtext. Don't you wish you were us? Marva points to the unsmiling kid caught in the background. Of one, I want to know who that guy is. He points to another and her. He's basically pointing out all the people I zoomed in on that day when I left the images open on my workstation. The three of them argue for a while over how to identify the kids who were just hiding in plain sight and the diamonds in the rough and the best kept secrets Beth Ann suggests with a cliche thi we cliche them to death until they come out. She glances at me and says, Anyway, some people don't like being the center of attention. Marvo chuckles. What? She scowls at him. Not everyone is starved for attention as you are. He leans back in his chair again and smiles at her. You'd be surprised. And I'm officially freaking out. So what do we feature in this not than usual overachievers section? Marissa opens her spiral notebook to a fresh page and writes a number one on the first line. I need names. Vicky Decker, says Marvo. I hold my breath expecting by curious to be the next word out of his mouth. Instead, he grins and says, secret weapon of the yearbook staff. And I bet she has some great ideas, don't you, Vicky? Marissa looks over at me, her pen poised to write. If Marvo knows about by curious, he's not outing me yet. I swallow and slowly raise my hand. You don't have to raise your hand, Vicky, says Marissa. I'll put it back down, hug it to my stomach. Sorry, you don't have to apologize. I almost say sorry again, but manage to stop myself. Just, what, says Marissa. Don't you want to be featured? No, I say. No, thank you. I drop my gaze to my knees, which are bouncing. I press my hand steady to them. I was thinking we could focus on kids who do stuff outside of school, like Hallie Bryce is a dancer, and I dart a glance at Marissa and Adrian Hahn and his band. She smiles, writes their names on her list. I think of a dozen other kids I've discovered online just by clicking on who follows who follows who. Elizabeth Gaffey makes the most amazing cupcakes, I say, and Darla McCann is a dog walker. She must walk 10 miles a day with different dogs. Also, there's Becca Elysian. She paints her fingernails to match the book she's reading, and Joffrey Phillips is helping his grandfather build a race car. It's pretty cool. Marissa keeps writing, and I keep talking faster as I go. There's a girl, Felicity, who's a yarn bomber. She knits scarves around trees, and Joshua Devin is really good at skateboarding. He does these amazing flips. I pause, but only for a second. Lindy Johnson makes jewelry out of soda tabs and safety pins. It sounds like they would look cheap, but they're really beautiful and delicate. And, uh, Raj Rackinson, he, um, I glance up, Marissa has stopped writing. I probably said too much, but I can't seem to stop. Raj, he takes these really interesting selfies. He stands exactly in the same spot every day, and he changes his clothes, of course, and gets his hair cut every few weeks. Objects, objects in the room move around sometimes. It's, uh, it's kind of, my voice drops to whisper, fascinating. Marvo tips his chair back and lets out a whole whistle. Beth Ann says, wow, and Marissa closes her notebook. I can't think of the last time I've spoken that many words at once, even if 
even in one unintimidated, unintended word vomits, and it's left me breathless and strangely invigorated. The bell rings and Marissa smiles, but as if someone's holding a gun to her head, forcing her to read a ransom note. Great ideas, Vicky. Well, uh, keep brainstorming. It's a good start, though. Really good. She backs away from me and put for me and out the other room. Beth then follows. Uh, but Marva holds the door. You coming, Vic? I gather my things and hurry out. I feel like a cat whose fur has been brushed the wrong way. I'm poised to skitter to one of my hiding spots, but I hesitate, estimating how long it will take me to reach the bathroom versus Miss Green's office, except someone else might be in there. So it would be quicker just to go straight to the bathroom, except if it, all the stalls are taken and then walk with me, says Marvo. I didn't even realize he was still there. He looks hooks his arm through mine and we're walking oh my god I'm walking down the hall with Marvo I never walked down the hall with anyone other than Jenna not on purpose at least other people have walked near me or next to me for a few paces but not with me I always slow down or speed up to leave a respectable gap but Marvo was walking with me our elbows linked his stride slowing to match my stuttering steps so how do you know all those people, he says. I never see you talking to anyone. Uh, I don't really, because they, they do sound fascinating. Yarn bombing? We keep walking, and Marvo's friends say hey and look at me funny. They're putting us together, and we don't belong together, and I really need to find the nearest bathroom. Much better than eight pages of football, says Marvo. Or cheerleader pyramids, which are great. I mean, no offense to cheerleaders, but it's the same every year. I'm really trying to listen to him, but my brain can can focus on only one thing at a time and right now I'm conscious of how much I'm sweating and worried he'll start to feel a little damp. Then Lipton is walking toward us and he sees me. His eyes get brighter. He smiles and flashes his dimple but then his gaze flits to my arm which is still hooked into Marvo's and the light dims and the dimple disappears. Marvo is still talking merrily but Lipton is getting away and I can't let that happen again. I push toward him dragging Marvo along. I reach for Lipton. I catch him by the wrist. He turns surprised Lipton. Hi hey I say breathlessly. This is Marvo. We work on the yearbook together. That's a, that's who he is. I awkwardly excite myself for Marvo's arm. After his initial startled expression and brief moment of confusion, Lipton's eyes are shine again. He nods to Marvo. Hey. And Marvo nods back at him. Hi. So, uh, Lipton might be someone we can feature in the yearbook, I say to Marvo. They both crinkle their eyebrows at me. He plays Minecraft, I declare. He's also very smart and nice and, you know, different than the usual, like we were talking about. Marvo appears on the verge of bursting out laughing, which I actually hope is at me and how idiotic I'm acting, not at Lipton, but he doesn't laugh. He just nods again and says, cool. Lipton, meanwhile, has turned an interesting shade of red. Nice meeting you dudes, says Marvo. Later, Vic. He walks away, glancing back, wants to give us a casual salute. I swallow. Sorry that I was. I don't want you to. It's okay, Lipton says quickly, his gaze, his gaze dropping to his feet with a sliver of his sock is exposed. It's plain old white athletic sock, no signature, red or blue or yellow. It makes me sad that I did that to him. Took the joy out of his socks. I'm so sorry about that day in class, I murmur when you asked me, you know, if I wanted to pet my cat. He cringes. I'm such an idiot. No, you're not. I am. I got get nervous in front of people and then I, then I, with your socks and Jeremy, I close my eyes for a second, frustrated at my inability to complete a sentence, my own words. As jambled as my thoughts were that day, it wasn't your fault, he says softly. I shouldn't have asked you in front of everybody. That was stupid. I'm stupid, I shake my head. Jeremy is stupid. Lipton snorts. Don't blame yourself for that. Jeremy has pretty much been bullying me since kindergarten. You could have said you loved my socks and really meant it, and he still would have made fun of me. I do love your socks. I glance down at the white, the colorful ones. Really? I nod and smile. He laughs. The sound of it lifts the tension from my shoulders, so... I'll see you in class tomorrow. Yeah, says Lipton. See you in class. We nearly collide in process of trying to walk away from each other. Lipton steps aside and gestures for me to go first. I head straight to Miss Green's office because I'm feeling good and don't want to lose it. The door is open, the twinkly lights are on, and Miss Green looks up and motions me to come in. I sit and I breathe. She lets me. I almost feel like talking. Almost. After a while, she says, You look happy today. I nod and pinch a smile between my lips. For the first time in a long time, I can't wait for tomorrow. The rest of the week is marked by small moments of happiness that make me wonder if I'm imagining things or slipping into a truly vicarious state. When Lipton's hand brushes against mine while passing out worksheets in class, I dig my fingernails into my palm to make sure I'm not dreaming. Five minutes later, I catch myself absolutely stroking the little spot where he touched me like a weirdo. 
I keep finding notes on my desk where when I get to class 2, another photocopy of information of the siege of Jerusalem and the tiniest piece of paper imaginable folded into an even tinier square with high written on it, a picture of a cat autographed missing UK. I tear off slightly larger piece of paper and write on a note back to him. Your cat's name starts with a K. He turns it over and writes something, slips it to me. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but he fails to provide the name I write back. Are you going to tell me what it is? He studies <coughs> the note a minute, tapping the end of his pencil on his chin. He finally writes back, then folds and folds and folds the note until it's super tiny. I unfold and unfold and unfold to reach his message. Kitty, I smile. It's too perfect. He puts his head down and writes again, then flips the page for up for me for a second. Up for me to see. Yours? I frown. How does he know I have a cat? For one panicked minute, I am sure he's seen my cat photo on Vicarious and knows that she is me. When I don't respond right away, he tears off another piece of paper, scribbles what appears to be a really long message, and tosses it into my lap. What's your cat's name? You obviously are a cat person, so I assumed you have a cat. Unless it died. Oh God, please tell me your cat didn't die. I'm such a jerk. I bite my lip to keep from smiling, though it sneaks out the corners of my mouth. His note sounds kind of like one of my own word vomits. Is it possible that another human brain functions even a little bit like mine? I write on the back of Lipton's note, you're not a jerk. My cat's name is Cat. Lipton reads it and laughs out loud. One barking burst of joy, everyone turns to stare, including Mr. Braxley. I stop breathing. Lipton pops the note in his mouth as if he were trading world secrets. Adam expresses his dimsy with his signature head on desk move. Mr. Braxley simply points to the trash bin next to his desk. Lipton rolls his eyes, strides there, pulls the note from his mouth, and drops it in the trash. Everyone's sneaking, snickering. I'm mortified. But Lipton smiles at me as he returns to his desk, and it makes me forget everyone else. I smile back. It reminds me of the way Jenna could set everything right with just a nudge and a hey. I don't think anyone else would ever, ever wield such powers again, and yet here is Lipton. He waits for me after class. He walks me part of the way to the next one. Neither of us say anything for a while. Then he stops and I stop. I could text you, he says softly, if I had your number. I stare at his left elbow. That's as close as I can get to eye contact as I consider his offer. Text from Lipton would surely add countless happy moments to my life. But it would also put him in a realm of vicarious, which is all I use my phone for anymore. And I don't know why. I just don't want him there. I don't want him here with me. I want him here with me, Vicky. I don't want you to text me, I say. Before I can explain myself further, his whole body slumps. Okay, fine, I. My eyes leap to his. Watch it. So all I can use because I like your notes better. I quickly add on paper there. I don't know. Real, he says. I nod. Exactly. Okay. We start walking again, the fabric of his jacket touching the knit of my sweater. The slight bit of contact gets me through the rest of the morning somehow. When lunch period arrives, I open the door to yearbook and glance at the list of people I suggested for a special section, which has been taped to the wall for two whole days now. I keep, it, keep expecting to find that Marissa has crumpled it up and thrown it away. I won't even be upset if she does, but it's still there. Marvo wasn't here today, just us girls. I go to my corner desk and start clicking through photos. Have you seen this, Marissa says to Beth Ann, who leans over her to look at her computer screen. Yeah, she's cool. Good taste and tattoo art. She lifts her head, red converse, and waggles the yin-yang toe in front of Marissa. Marvo loves her. He says she's the only person who understands him, which thinks a lot, but whatever. She cheers him up when he's in one of his funks. I hope she posts something today so he can get his butt back to school. I stop clicking the second I realize they are talking about Vicarious, and now I'm trying not to gawk. Marvo has funks. I can hardly believe it. He's always laughing, talking like he's the only standing in perpetual spotlight, always performing, but I don't see him every day. Come to think of it, I don't see him lots of days. Adrian is totally obsessed with her, Marissa says. He wants to dye his hair purple and orange next time. I stop breathing. It's cool, I guess, says Marissa, but anybody with a wig and Photoshop could do it. I don't see what all the fuss is about. Beth Ann laughs. Yeah, and I couldn't, could have written a kick-ass book about a boy wizard, but I think I... But I didn't think of it first, did I? Marissa sighs. I can't believe she has so many followers for basically crashing everybody else's party. It's more than that, says Beth Ann. Have you read the comments? Yeah, I get it. She sees me, Marissa rolls her eyes. Now if I can get to Adrian to see me, he wouldn't shut up the other night about how cool it would be if she vicarious one of his gigs. I'm trying very hard not to let the, fr the freak out that's happening inside me 
show on the outside. Adrian wants Vicarious to feature his band. He wants to dye his hair to match hers. I turn back to my computer and pretend to be working, but I'm just zoning in and out. Zooming in and out of the same photo and trying to not hyperventilate, Marissa rolls her chair over to where I'm sitting and watches me from the side of my desk. I quickly find some teeth to whiten, some shadows to brighten. I remove a stop sign that looks like it's growing out of someone's head. Vicky could could do it, couldn't you? She nods toward my monitor, photoshop someone into a crowd. What? I swallow? I don't. But you could if you wanted to, right? I wouldn't. Oh my god, Vicky, I didn't say you would, just that you sh you could. She turns to Beth Ann. I mean, who knows who this girl is? It could be anyone. It could be Vicky, and half a million people are following her like she's some kind of messiah. I'm tempted to correct her on the number of followers. Rhyming Reyes fans are still flocking to my site, but I'm only up to about 327,000 as of last count. I'm not even on Instagram, I say. She snaps her head to face me. I was speaking hypothetically. Dude, Beth Ann cuts in. You're pissed at your boyfriend. Don't take it out on Vicky. Marissa inhales deeply and holds it for a few seconds. Then Marissa and then blows it out. She smiles at me. I'm sorry. That was rude. I just meant that anyone halfway proficient at Photoshop could be vicarious. You could be vicarious. Still rude, says Beth Ann, shaking her head. You're suggesting that someone like Vicky could possibly have half a million followers. That she'd only deserve it if she were famous or popular like you. Marissa clenches her teeth. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. I just... You totally slammed our girl Vicky here because your boyfriend has the hots for someone on the internet and you can't say I'm better than her because you don't know who she is, says Beth Ann. And that's super frustrating because you're used to being better than everybody. Marissa's face goes red and she looks like she's going to cry. I don't think I'm better than any everybody or anybody. She grabs her book and storms out. We watch her go. Beth Ann groans and folds her arms across her desk and drops her head into them. I'm such a bitch. I'm not sure what to say, so I don't say anything. I know she hates being called a bitch, but does that count when she calls herself one? She was kind of hard on Marissa. Beth Ann snorts and sits up. Great, even the nicest person on the planet thinks I'm a bitch. I don't. Please, at least you're honest. It's good to know there's one person around here who isn't a total fake. She grabs her book and her book bag and leaves the room. I pull my lunch out, eat in the quiet. A new list forming in my head for once. It's not things that terrify me. It's not about me. It's a list of everybody I know who's suffering or struggling in their own way. Hallie, Raj, Lipton, Marissa, Marvel, Bethann. They're all names I would never have expected to find on the same list, but I've always thought that thought were perfect, were either perfect or happy or didn't care. It's a list I can mentally add one more name to. Vicky. Which makes me happy. I'm ashamed to admit. I don't mean to reveal in anyone else's pain, but I've existed on a list one, f on a list of one for so long. It feels good to have others I can count myself among, even even if they have no idea. They're not alone, and neither am I. That is the end of chapter 19. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.